Thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, nice conference and to uh, Krakow. Um, I'm happy to be here and uh, thanks for the nice introduction. So uh, today, as you heard, I would like to give you an overview about the work we are doing or have been doing on performance monitoring and adaptive control. So um, in many situations, or actually constantly, we have to monitor our behavior. For example, in, uh, when driving on the road with tra heavy traffic, we have to monitor multiple streams of incoming information. And if there is any unexpected change that can be due to our own mistakes or to mistakes of other drivers, uh, we have to adjust our behavior accordingly to avoid any fatal consequences. And as you will see, we have a broad repertoire of uh, different ways of uh, adapting to um, mistakes. So we can have very general reactions uh, and also very task-specific uh, adaptations that help us to optimize our goal achievement. So beyond the uh, error monitoring, we have been interested how the brain determines when and whether adaptation is needed. So performance monitoring can be understood as part of a feedback loop. So when we make an action, uh, we, uh, our performance monitoring system constantly monitors the outcome of our actions and uh, um, the state, what's that, uh, the state uh, of um, uh, ourselves and of the environment. And um, if there's any event indicating that uh, the outcome might not uh, be met uh, as the goal, or there might be a discrepancy between the outcome and the goals, then this indicates that adaptation is needed. And the performance monitoring system extracts information for an, from any motivationally salient events and, and signals the necessity, magnitude, and perhaps also the type of adaptation uh, to other brain regions, which then implement this adaptation. And uh, there are many kinds of adaptations, as I already mentioned, starting from very general effects like uh, increasing arousal and preparing the body uh, with autonomic responses to reacting um, to some motor adjustments, selective changes in selective attention, learning, decision-making, action selection, and also uh, performance monitoring can influence affect and motivation. And finally, we have metacognitive uh, functions that help us uh, evaluating our own abilities and getting confidence about uh, the environment. So let me briefly introduce some uh, correlates we can record non-invasively uh, uh, about performance monitoring. So uh, research has shown that um, the posterior mesial frontal cortex encompassing the anterior mid cingulate cortex, the sub pre-supplementary motor area, and uh, the dorsomedial prefrontal cortex is uh, activated whenever there is uh, the need for adaptation. Uh, you might wonder about uh, the terminology, so I'm using um, the terminology uh, introduced by Brand Vogt, a uh, neuroanatomist, but uh, you can, in the literature, often see also names like dorsal anterior cingulate cortex for the same region, anterior mid cingulate cortex, or if you want to compare uh, human and uh, monkey anatomy, this region might overlap with uh, what's called rostral cingulate zone. Uh, in the event-related potentials, we see a rather uniform sequence of deflections that are associated with different um, situations when adaptation is needed. So first, we have often a frontocentral negativity followed by a frontocentral positivity, and these, the, this sequence of waves is usually uh, or is assumed to be generated in the posterior mesial frontal cortex. And this is followed by a more uh, parietal later um, positivity. So, for example, in reaction, sorry, uh, in reaction time tasks, um, uh, we can see an error-related negativity that occurs about 50 to 100 milliseconds after the erroneous response, uh, and uh, this is followed by an early fr uh, frontocentral error positivity and a late, uh, later, more parietal uh, error positivity (PE) again. Um, when, in other situations, when uh, we act under uncertainty, we need external feedback to disambiguate whether our outcome was correct or incorrect. And in these cases, uh, the feedback-related negativity is uh, um, shown, 
I, I'm seeing that there was the, the, the font has changed, so you can't really read it. So the FRN, the feedback-related negativity, is similar to the uh, ERN, a negativity that follows neg usually negative feedback, and then this is followed by a frontocentral P3A and a later parietal P3B. Uh, uh, in other situations, when we are still acting, uh, our performance monitoring might indicate that more effort is needed to uh, achieve the goal. And when this effort is invested, this is usually in, uh, um, associated with an N2, which is followed again by a, a P3A and a P3B. So we always have this negativity-positivity sequence. So since the discovery of the error-related negativity in 1990, uh, multiple theories about uh, performance monitoring have been put forward. Um, most of these theories agree that uh, the performance monitoring system, and particularly the posterior medial frontal cortex, signals the need for adaptation. But they debate about what signals actually are represented in this brain region and uh, what computations are uh, going on there. So a, a lot of um, uh, theories are built or based on uh, reinforcement learning theory. And already in the 70s, as many of you know, um, Rescola and Wagner have developed a ma very simple mathematical model that has proven to be quite successful to explain uh, learning processes in uh, neurobiology. And uh, this formula is actually working like this, that uh, value, a predicted value of either a stimulus or an action outcome is updated uh, based on a certain update term. And this update term is uh, actually a weighted uh, prediction error. So we have a weighting factor that is reflecting the learning rate, or in other words, the impact a single outcome has on our future decisions. And the learning uh, and the prediction error delta, or uh, in this case, assigned reward prediction error, which is just the difference of the obtained outcome and the previous prediction we had. So other um, uh, learning theories also uh, used surprise as a uh, signal to teach learning uh, processes, for example, Pierce-Hall learning. So when you take the absolute value of the prediction error, this is actually showing the deviation from expectancy, which is very closely related to um, surprise, that it indicates the magnitude of the deviation, so that uh, how much uh, you have to adjust your, um, for example, value. Uh, since the seminal paper by Clay Holroyd and Mike Holtz in 2002, uh, it has been debated whether the uh, error-related negativity and the feedback-related negativity reflect um, prediction error signals. And we addressed this uh, in a study about five years ago where we used the probabilistic instrumental learning task, and people had to make a decision whether to choose or avoid uh, one uh, stimulus or several stimuli that were presented on the screen. And stimuli could be uh, good, bad, or neutral in terms of their reward probability. So good stimuli gave a reward in 70 or 80 percent and a punishment only in uh, 20 or 30 uh, percent of the trials. So if when subjects uh, chose to bet on this stimulus, they uh, actually received real feedback uh, that was uh, mon the monetary reward, for example, 10 cents, which is favorable, of course, and should strengthen the tendency to stay with choosing that stimulus. If they obtain a negative uh, outcome that's unfavorable, and it should increase their likelihood to switch to uh, avoiding that stimulus next time. Uh, if they decided to avoid that stimulus, they um, did actually neither lose or uh, gain any money in the outcome. So these were just uh, avoid trials. They did not bet on them. But they always saw uh, the counterfactual or fictive outcomes of uh, their uh, choices. So they saw what would have happened had they chosen instead. So and this could be a, a win, a, a missed win, which is unfavorable, in fact, because they uh, have foregone some, some gain. And uh, this should indicate uh, that they should perhaps switch their, uh, to choosing that stimulus uh, next time again. And if they uh, actually avoided a, a loss, that's uh, favorable, and they should stay with avoiding that stimulus. <laughs> 
So uh, in the behavioral data, you can see that uh, participants quickly learn to uh, choose good stimuli, avoid bad stimuli, and uh, there was actually no uh, behavioral difference between uh, uh, these uh, choose and avoidance um, uh, decisions. Reaction times decreased exponentially uh, with time on task, and um, we used um, standard Riscola Wagner model uh, to explain the data with one difference in contrast to standard models which use a constant learning rate. We used a learning rate that decayed over time logarithmically because when you learn, after, after learning progresses, you get more and more certainty, so the update of your value will be actually smaller and smaller, and you should ignore probabilistic in, incorrect outcomes at late stages of learning, and this is implemented by this decaying learning rate. And you can see with the lines shown in this plot that actually the fit to the data was pretty good. And um, this gave us uh, a trial-by-trial -trial estimate of uh, prediction errors and learning rates, which we then could use for model-based analysis of the EEG data that we recorded. And uh, we, we did this uh, by means of multiple robust regression analysis. So uh, we did a single trial uh, um, analysis within each subject where we uh, looked for co-variations of the EEG amplitude with a given variable here, for example, the prediction error, the reward prediction error. And uh, what you're seeing here is a sequence of topographies uh, that actually reflect the uh, regression coefficients and, uh, for this uh, uh, reward prediction error. And uh, red colors indicate a positive covariation, blue colors a negative covariation, and uh, um, this was corrected for multiple comparisons, so everything that's not significant is actually masked out in white. So uh, when looking at the reward prediction error, you can see that uh, there is a central positive uh, covariation with the EEG amplitude uh, between 250 and 300 milliseconds. And uh, if there's an unfavorable outcome, that actually is a, n a real feedback connected to a negative reward prediction error. So you get a negative deflection in the EEG. That's nothing uh, else than the classical feedback-related negativity. Uh, this is followed by uh, negative correlations at uh, first frontal and then more central and parietal electrodes that contribute to the P3A and the P3B in the classical um, uh, event-related potential. So in order to test whether this covariation is indeed reflecting a, a reward prediction error, we regressed the EEG activity against the components of the uh, reward prediction error uh, term that is uh, predicted or expected value and outcome. And uh, as you can see, at the time of the uh, feedback-related negativity, there are opposite effects. So a negative correlation of the expected outcome and a positive correlation uh, uh, of the actually obtained outcome. And uh, that um, suggests that the FRN really uh, reflects a um, like prediction error signal. The P3A and P3B are mostly outcome-driven, as you can see there. So it seems that the feedback-related negativity really reflects uh, um, prediction, uh, reward prediction errors. But on the other hand, there is a number of studies suggesting that a feedback-related uh, negativity is also driven by surprise. That would be unsigned prediction errors. And in order to address this, we uh, used a different task. We actually combined a classical flanker, Ericsson flanker task with a novelty oddball task. So people have to made, had to make a speeded response and made a number of errors in, these, in this uh, flanker task. And the response was always followed by a confirmatory visual stimulus, an upright triangle that was presented on both uh, error and correct trials. On a very small subset of trials, uh, this triangle was uh, re inverted and people had to press uh, uh, another button that was only done to direct their attention to this otherwise absolutely irrelevant uh, stimulus. Uh, and in a subset of trials, which actually it was, uh, uh, occurred at equal frequency at uh, the individual error rate, we, instead of the uh, triangle, presented novel line drawings 
that were like, like, for example, this frog or a snowman or a car and so on, which were not instructed, so a bit surprising to subjects, but they had no meaning to them. And um, when you look at the behavior, behavior, both errors as well as these novel um, line drawings were actually followed by a slowed reaction times. So we had post-error slowing and also post-surprise slowing, which was almost equal. And in fMRI, we found that both conditions uh, elicited activity in the posterior medial frontal cortex. In, EEG, in, in the EEG, the, um, uh, the, the errors uh, were associated with the error-related negativity and uh, surprising outcomes, uh, which were valence-free, were associated with uh, the N2 and a later P3A, which is not shown here. Using Blind source separation analysis uh, with independent component analysis, we actually could show that uh, the N2 here can, can be explained in part by the sources of the error related negativity, suggesting that they have at least in part overlapping uh, generators. So, in sum, we can state that uh, the uh, posterior medial frontal cortex codes both signed and unsigned prediction errors. And this is what has been found in monkeys as well. For example, Matsuwoto and colleagues already in 2007 showed that uh, in the cingulate sulcus there are neurons that code positive reward prediction errors, other neurons that code negative reward prediction er errors, and yet other neurons that code both positive and negative or just unsigned prediction errors. And there were other studies uh, supporting this view. So now we have shown that there is a discrepancy signal indicating that perhaps uh, there should be uh, an adjustment in behavior. But this has to be weighted, and how is that weighted? I already mentioned in Riscola wagner um, models, this is realized via the learning rate alpha, and the learning rate alpha is influenced again by um, reinforcement history, so that means um, the statistics of the outcomes, of, re uh, of recent outcomes in similar situations. How often did I get a reward? How often uh, uh, did I get a punishment for a certain choice? And this is helping to weight the meaning or the, the uh, yeah, inform informativity of a single uh, reward prediction error signal. And already in, in 2006, Steve Kennelly and colleagues showed that lesions of the anterior cingulate sulcus in monkeys impaired tracking of reinforcement history. The behavior of the monkeys became erratic and that was only driven by the most recent outcome. In fMRI, people have shown that uh, actually uh, the anterior mid cingulate cortex codes the learning rate or actually also the value update or in more complex models, uh, belief updates like the... Um, and finally, a study by uh, McGuire and colleagues uh, showed uh, that different factors influencing the learning rate actually converge on a network uh, encompassing the anterior mid cingulate cortex, the anterior insular cortex, and parietal cortex. So now, what happened to the learning rate in our probabilistic learning task? We regressed the changing, uh, uh, decaying learning rate uh, against the EEG and found that it was associated with a sustained central parietal positive shift of the EEG over quite a long time. And uh, this was maximal between the uh, latencies of the feedback-related negativity and the P3A. So the higher the learning rate, the more impact and outcome had for the future decisions of the subjects, the more positive going was the EEG. Of course, this study had the problem that uh, our uh, learning rate was decaying over time, so it was actually confounded with uh, time on task. So for this reason, we actually developed a, a reversal learning variant of uh, our uh, probabilistic learning tasks. So we had, again, good, bad, and neutral stimuli, and without any prior notice, they could change their uh, values after a certain number of trials uh, so that good stimuli could become bad or neutral and vice versa. And uh, here, people have to accumulate evidence uh, about uh, the values. So after a value change, they make a number of reversal errors. Uh, so surprise about the outcome should add up over time. You would have increased uh, reward prediction errors and also absolute reward prediction errors over some time until 
the subject decides to choose uh, the other uh, according to the, the new rule. So this helps to learn. If you increase uh, at that time your learning, right, that would help to, uh, to learn the new rules. So any model that uses a constant learning rate or just a decaying learning rate would not fit the data uh, so well. And uh, for this reason, um, the, the lab by Nathaniel Daw and colleagues have suggested a combined Riscola Wagner Piers Hall hybrid model, uh, which we also used in that case. So this is consisting of a standard Riscola, delta, Riscola Wagner delta rule, where a, a prediction error is weighted by an associability or a, 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 the learning rate. And this learning rate consists of actually two terms. It's the weighted absolute prediction error, a measure of surprise, and the counterweighted uh, previous learning rate. So this uh, weighting factor, eta, determines how this model behaves. So if eta uh, becomes uh, close to, sorry, uh, close to one, uh, then uh, actually this is mostly surprise-driven, and uh, if it's uh, getting close to zero, uh, this gets uh, actually almost a standard uh, Riscola-Wagner model with uh, a constant learning rate. So uh, let me show you the, this uh, for one example subject. So here you see the plots, I hope you can see it. Yes, the plots for um, the absolute prediction error across trials with a blockwise variation of uh, the um, reward probability. And you see that on, in, on, on uh, probabilistic um, outcomes, you have large prediction errors, and after rule changes, of course, you have large prediction errors that after a while decay. Uh, when you look at the associability or the learning rate, you see that this is always increased after these surprising events. So it, it increases after rule changes and then decays over time again, but also probabilistic uh, um, um, unexpected outcomes uh, will, of course, lead to an increase. And now in blue, you see the expected value, and you see it nicely tracks actually the real values of these stimuli, so it approaches 80%, 20%, and so on. So when we use this model and uh, extract the trial-by-trial prediction errors and learning rates and regress this against, against the EEG data, we can replicate our previous findings. So again, we find a frontocentral uh, co a positive covariation with a reward prediction error that's uh, related to the uh, feedback-related negativity, then the P3A and the P3B. And we also find a sustained central uh, positivity that's associated with the learning rate. Finally, after 400 milliseconds, we have mostly a central parietal positivity, which, uh, like an earpiece, would be related to the P3B. And we suggest this is reflecting a common final pathway of adaptation. And we, uh, we, it actually consists of several uh, components, or we found several factors contributing to this uh, para central parietal effect. So this is, of course, the uh, effect of the unfavorable outcome, the reward prediction error effect I showed you before. And the sign of this is uh, directed as, uh, like, the, the more uh, evidence indicates that you should change your behavior, or update your values, the higher, the more positive going is this uh, P3B. So the more unfavorable the outcome is. Then we have this learning rate effect I already mentioned. And we had an additional switch regressor that predicted or, or that decoded whether subjects would shift their behavior next time they see the same stimulus or not. So it was about three trials later, on average, that they saw the same stimulus again. And this was predicted uh, by this uh, uh, yeah, central parietal positivity again. Uh, so this, this regressor actually captures uh, everything that's not covered by our reinforcement learning model, everything in the behavior. So it suggests that um, this P3B is related to updating the values and guiding future decisions. And this fits very nicely to findings by uh, other people showing that the P3B uh, encodes evidence accumulation to bound decision signals in um, uh, perceptual decision-making tasks. So um, let me summarize this part first. We have, uh, with uh, our um, 
multiple uh, regression analysis, single trial analysis, a nice tool to uh, have a high type, uh, temporal resolution to see different factors that contribute to uh, performance monitoring and learning. So on the one hand, we can see the reward prediction error and surprise effects that occur at the time of a feedback-related negativity. We have this learning rate effect that's sustained, and we have the uh, evidence uh, accumulation for adaptation that's related to the P3B. So let's now come to the trial-by-trial post-error adjustments that are triggered by uh, detecting mistakes or other performance problems. Uh, in uh, the literature, most, mostly people have looked at uh, two types of adaptations. First, we have a very general effect post error slowing, which I've already mentioned. So uh, people, when, when people encounter a mistake, they push the brakes. It's a very general effect. And then they reorient to the task again or to the causes of the error. So uh, that seems to be implemented via the motor system. On the other hand, there are more task-specific adjustments, like top-down modulation of attention. So, uh, for example, uh, when there are distracting inputs, one has to, of course, focus at the task, on the task at hand, and we should, uh, should enhance important output, input and suppress distracting inputs uh, in order to avoid future mistakes. <clears throat> so let's uh, first look at post-error slowing. That has been well known since the discovery uh, in 1966 by uh, Patrick Rabbit. And here you see a number of different studies showing sequences of trials, always uh, sequences of positive uh, or uh, correct trials, which usually uh, um, are associated with response time speeding until people make a mistake, which usually is even faster uh, and then this is followed by a slowing of response times, post-error slowing. And as you can also see, in many studies, uh, this post-error slowing effect is very short-lived, or it decays very quickly. Uh, in fMRI studies, we found evidence that post-error slowing is related to reduced motor cortex activity. So, for example, here again you see trial-by-trial trial bold activity in the motor cortices, and you see there's a selective decrease of motor cortex activity after the mistake. And we also found that actually the error-related activity here in the posterior medial frontal cortex correlated with the subsequent decrease in motor cortex activity, and that in turn correlated with the behavioral post-error slowing effect. And we have suggested that uh, post-error slowing is actually implemented by a reduction of corticospinal excitability, and there are some TMS studies by Jan Wessel and Emmanuel and colleagues uh, supporting this view. Uh, also in EEG, a number of studies have shown that uh, the error-related negativity and also the early PE can predict post-error slowing. So here you see the results of a multiple regression analysis again, and it indicates that larger, that means more negative error-related negativities and more positive uh, uh, error, early error positivities predict subsequent uh, prolongation of reaction times. And this is uh, found only at the within the subject's level. So in a very large sample, we can, could show that this is really uh, the case in most people within subjects. So a large ERN uh, on one trial will actually uh, lead to slower response times on the next trial. But between subjects, we didn't find such a relationship, which, which indicates that you cannot... Uh, um, infer from large individual uh, amplitudes of the error-related negativity that people would have stronger post-error slowing or stronger adjustments. Uh, it's only working within subjects. So using uh, diffusion-weighted imaging, uh, we uh, looked at the, at the measure of uh, white matter integrity and directionality, the uh, fractional anisotropy, and we, uh, across subjects, correlated the fractional anisotropy with individual size of post-era slowing, and we found uh, correlations beneath the posterior medial frontal cortex. And in order to understand what that means, we reconstructed fiber, by probabilistic fiber tracking uh, what this region is actually connected to. And we found a network that, com uh, that uh, triangulated the pre-SMA, 
the right inferior frontal gyrus and the basal ganglia, presumably the subthalamic nucleus. And this network has previously been shown to be associated with uh, motor inhibition. So this makes a lot of sense. And also models of uh, decision making, uh, frontal striatal models of decision making, like the ones put forward by Michael Frank and colleagues, suggest that the subthalamic nucleus might be involved in uh, these uh, performance monitoring induced slowings. So uh, in our case, we would suggest that error-related uh, activity in the posterior medial frontal cortex is conveyed via the hyperdirect pathway to the subthalamic nucleus, which then sends out a global inhibition, motor inhibition signal, and uh, leads to posterior slowing. And we had the opportunity in a collaboration with uh, the, the Department of Neurology uh, in Berlin at the Charité to study uh, um, par patients with uh, severe Parkinson's disease who underwent uh, the implantation of uh, deep brain stimulation electrodes in the STN, in the subthalamic nucleus. And we, uh, th their cables were externalized for a few days, so we had the chance to record local field potentials from the subthalamic nucleus and at the same time uh, EEG from midline electrodes. And we did so uh, um, twice, actually, on and off their standard L-DOPA medication while these uh, patients performed a flanker task, which elicited a sufficient number of errors to analyze them. So in the scalp EEG, we see an error-related negativity and also an error positivity in these patients, as one would expect. Uh, in the uh, local field potentials from the subthalamic nucleus, we see several deflections in, uh, uh, which differ between correct and incorrect responses. Uh, by the way, there is no influence of dopaminergic uh, medication here for the uh, waveforms. And there's an early uh, difference between correct and incorrect, which uh, is actually at the time of the response. And I would not think that this is closely related to error detection. It's rather related to the reasons why the mistake was actually made. And there's a second one around 300 to 400 milliseconds. And uh, we actually separated the trials into those that were followed by post-error slowing and those that were not followed by post-error slowing. And we found, uh, after correction for multiple comparison, still a significant difference. So there was larger uh, activity in the subthalamic nucleus uh, on errors which were followed by post-error slowing, supporting the view that uh, the subthalamic nucleus is involved in that. So let's now turn to post-error increase in selective attention. Uh, in 2011, we showed that uh, actually activity in the posterior medial frontal cortex predicted uh, changes in top-down uh, changes in selective attention. On the one hand, uh, we found that it predicted the increase of activity in task-relevant visual areas. In that case, it was color. And uh, it also predicted the decrease uh, of activity in other regions where it were actually uh, coding distracting uh, stimulus information. But one thing that was, of course, unclear was how this information is actually transmitted. And um, um, animal research suggests that uh, acetylcholine plays a major role in attentional regulation. And interestingly, there are uh, quite a number of projections from the posterior medial frontal cortex to the basal forebrain, the source of the uh, uh, cholinergic innervation of the cortex in humans, the nucleus basalis of Minard. And in rats, it has been demonstrated that stimulation of singlet neurons projecting to the uh, basal forebrain and of the basal forebrain neurons itself both had facilitatory, facilitatory effects in the visual cortex, which could be blocked using the muscarinic antagonist atropine, which abolished these uh, facilitatory effects. Uh, a later optogenetic study also supported this view. And finally, uh, the anatomy of the uh, basal forebrain suggests that there is a modular uh, uh, organization, so that might enable more task-specific modulations. So we set out to test whether post-error uh, adjustments in uh, attention are mediated by acetylcholine uh, recruited through activity from the uh, medial frontal cortex. And to do so, uh, we tested 30 male participants in a double-blind, placebo-controlled uh, crossover study where they either received uh, saline or 
uh, as a placebo, or the muscarinic antagonist by peridin uh, via infusion IV. Uh, between sessions, we had like eight days of washout time, and of course, it was uh, in a counterbalanced order. Our hypothesis were mostly focused on the posterior medial frontal cortex and the visual cortices because the basal forebrain is pretty, pretty hard to scan, particularly at 3T with standard sequences. So um, what we expected was that we would replicate our previous findings in the placebo condition when cholinergic signaling is intact. And uh, we expected enhancement of uh, activity in task-relevant visual areas after errors, suppression in task-irrelevant visual areas, and uh, behavioral adaptation that is related to that. Uh, if we block the muscarinic receptors, we would uh, expect that uh, these post-error adjustments are reduced uh, and that the interaction of posterior medial frontal cortex and visual cortex is uh, also reduced or blocked. We used a modified Simon task in which people had to respond to the color of eccentrically presented uh, arrows so color was the relevant stimulus feature dimension. Uh, localization and direction of the arrow uh, were irrelevant. So this is a congruent trial where all features point into the same direction, like a left-hand response. And this is an uh, incongruent um, uh, trial uh, where actually color indicates a left-hand response, but uh, the, the irrelevant um, feature dimensions direction and uh, localization would actually interfere with this and suggest the right-hand right response. So we would have longer reaction times and more errors. Uh, we ran this in a scanner after the pharmacological manipulation and, uh, in addition, a separate color localizer task. In the behavioral data, we find no treatment effects on error rates or Simon interference effects, just uh, general slowing of reactions by about 30 milliseconds when in the biperidin session. More interestingly, uh, biperidin treatment abolished trial-by-trial -trial adjustments. Post-error slowing was gone, but also post-error reduction of interference. So this means that uh, in placebo, we see that the interference effect is actually reduced after errors. That is the difference of reaction times between incongruent and congruent trials. So after errors, uh, it seems that attention to the relevant stimulus features uh, has been increased such that the interfering effect uh, is smaller. But this uh, reduction of interference was gone after biperidin. So in order to disentangle the time courses of the fMRI signal from error trials and post-error trials, we actually used uh, independent component analysis followed by deconvolution of the time courses to get a clean time course. And uh, here you see three components that overlap with the posterior medial frontal cortex, and that show a time course that is consistent with this error monitoring function. So we find s isolated signal increases on error trials in both placebo and biperidin conditions. We also found components that overlap with activity in the color localizer. So the color localizer gave this activity here, uh, shown in purple, and here you see the outline again, and we had uh, three uh, um, components that overlap with that. And when we looked at the time course of this in the placebo condition, we see first a reduction of activity on error trials, suggesting that errors were really driven by reduced attention to the task relevant stimulus feature. Uh, and then we see a relatively slow, unexpectedly slow increase of activity again on the subsequent trials. Um, it was similar in a previous study, but still it's, it's uh, surprisingly slow. Uh, the interesting part here is that the error-related activity in the posterior medial frontal cortex predicted this slope of this increase in the placebo condition. In the biperidin condition, uh, this increase on post-era trials is actually much slower and weaker. And there's no correlation of uh, error-related activity in the posterior medial frontal cortex and this uh, activity change in color processing uh, cortical areas. Finally, uh, this uh, changes in activity, post-era changes in activity in these uh, color-sensitive cortical areas uh, are related to post-era reduction of interference in the behaviors. There was a correlation, but again, only in the placebo condition, not in the biperidin condition.
Uh, we can also look at uh, task uh, coding of task irrelevant visual activity. And we, uh, in this case, it was a bit difficult. We reasoned that any visual activity that is not overlapping with a color localizer should code something that is not that relevant for uh, solving that task. So there was a number of components. This is an example. And you see here's the color localizer that's uh, in a different region. And when we, show, uh, when we look at the time course, we see there is a gradual increase until the error occurs, suggesting that people's attention has drifted away towards uh, anything else that could uh, drive their behavior. And after the error, there is a steep decrease in activity uh, uh, suggesting that there's a suppression of um, uh, attention to the task irrelevant uh, stimuli. And again, this was predicted uh, by activity in the posterior medial frontal cortex in the placebo condition. There was also a similar effect in the biparadine condition, but the, the, the relationship between activity in the posterior medial frontal cortex and uh, the um, task irrelevant visual cortical areas was weaker. So to summarize, uh, error-related uh, activity, uh, activity in the posterior medial frontal cortex predicts post-error attention and regulation. We could replicate that. And blocking acetylcholinergic muscarinic receptors impairs uh, behavioral and neuronal post-error adjustments. Um, so this provides strong support that uh, acetylcholine mediates trial-by-trial post-error adjustments in attention. And this also might explain the um, beneficial effect of choline esterase inhibitors on other functions than just memory uh, in uh, Alzheimer's disease, and also uh, some reports of uh, uh, the effects of low-frequency deep brain stimulation in the nucleus basalis of minor. So in the last part, I hope I have still a little bit of time, I would like to contribute to a recent ongo recently ongoing discussion uh, that uh, pertains to the question whether post-error slowing is actually an adaptive mechanism or not. Originally, people have thought that post-error slowing is an adaptation that puts us in a very cautious response mode, allowing us to uh, actually increase our uh, accuracy on post-error trials. And um, a number of studies support this. So there were post-error trials with increased accuracy and post-error slowing uh, quite a lot. But some studies, since the 70s, you can always find some studies in the, uh, in the literature that show actually no change in accuracy or even a decrease in accuracy on post-error trials despite substantial post-error slowing. Sorry. Um, uh, there, a number of adaptive accounts suggest that post-error slowing enables more accurate responses. And this was formalized um, by the response conflict monitoring model uh, uh, by Matt Botwinick and colleagues in 2001. And they suggested two, two mechanisms. First, uh, the performance monitoring signal leads to an increase in response thresholds. So there's more time until the evidence for the response uh, accumulates allowing actually more accuracy. So this would be a mechanism that we know as speed accuracy trade-off. But in addition, they also suggest that there, this time is also being used for implementing more specific uh, attentional regulation, like an uh, re enforcement, reinforcement of task rules which improve uh, attention to uh, task relevant stimuli. So this should um, lead to higher accuracy on post-error trials over and above, uh, actually, uh, speed accuracy trade-off effects. On the other hand, uh, it has been more recently suggested that actually the post-error slowing is part of the orienting reflex, which was originally described by Sokolov. Um, and the orienting reflex occurs at any kind of unexpected outcome. So errors would be just one instance so, for example, if a, if a loud noise would occur behind you, you would orient your uh, uh, attention to that. You would stop your current behavior. So there would be general motor inhibition. You would disengage your selective attention from the activity you're currently doing, and you would turn around and uh, evaluate what's happening behind you. So it's actually, in certain cases, a very adaptive mechanism. But in our experiments, when we uh, have repetitive um, attention demanding tasks that, uh, uh, and we make errors in that. It's actually maladaptive to disengage from attention there. So both, uh, um, both 
models would have uh, slightly different predictions. Uh, like they have the same prediction that there would be an increase in motor threshold. So uh, leading to longer evidence accumulation, longer uh, re response times, and higher accuracy. But a selective attention would also uh, say that uh, as adaptive accounts would also say that selective intention is increased, leading to higher uh, perceptual signal-to-noise ratio and steeper evidence accumulation. But the model is not very, or the, the theories are not very precise about timing, so it's unclear when this should happen. And uh, as I showed you in this uh, previous fMRI, it might actually happen much later than post aerosolwing uh, the orienting account would uh, suggest that selective attention is disengaged. So that would lead to lower perceptual uh, signal-to-noise ratio and less steep evidence accumulation. And it would be also suggest that this, is, that this happens simultaneously to the post-era slowing effect. So it would be an early effect and a, uh, actually quickly decaying effect. And there's evidence for both theories, of course, in the literature. And uh, in order to, to address this question, it would be very nice to have a measure, that an online measure of evidence accumulation and response thresholds that we could use to really test them, test these uh, pr predictions on post-era trials. Uh, in order to tell you a little bit more what these measures are, evidence accumulation and uh, response threshold, uh, uh, let me explain you the task we were using and uh, this all in the framework of a drift diffusion model. So we used uh, the classical flanker task where people had to make a very speeded response under time pressure. They had to respond to the central target arrow that was presented uh, here or here and um, had to make a left hand or right hand response. And this uh, central relevant target arrow was surrounded by irrelevant to be ignored uh, flanker arrows that could be compatible or incompatible with uh, the required response. And to make it a bit harder, actually these uh, flanker arrows were presented earlier, so there was 80, 80 milliseconds uh, um, stimulus onset asynchrony. And we had a large sample with a large number of trials, so we can really uh, test this nicely. And we <coughs> um, adjusted a uh, uh, the drift diffusion model to the specifics of this uh, uh, flanker task, and uh, I cannot explain you the full model. It uh, uh, would uh, take too much time, but I would like to refer you to tomorrow's lecture by Adrian Fischer in the decision-making session, who will actually uh, give you some more information on this model and then some other findings we had in this data set. So uh, just briefly, so this green line here would show the diffu diffusion process. It starts at a random point around zero, and then there's some random variation before uh, the, actually the, the uh, stimulus onset. And then after stimulus onset and some processing time, uh, the flanker uh, processing would lead to a, a drift in, into their direction. In this case, it's compatible, so it would go downwards to the chosen response. And then after uh, some time, the target information would kick in and uh, would uh, support this drift into this direction. And when this drift diffusion process crosses a response threshold, then the response is elicited. In our case, we used a, a, a response boundary that was collapsing in order to implement uh, the necessity of time pressure so that people would have to make a response even when their evidence is not so certain yet, but because they were on, under high time pressure. So when this, crosses, this line crosses the, the boundary, then there, uh, there is a response. So for incongruent trials or incompatible trials, you see that uh, the flanker drift first leads to a drift into the wrong direction, and then this is corrected by the targets. And finally, an error on incongruent trials would occur when the flanker-induced drift actually leads to a crossing of the response threshold. So this is what the model uh, suggests just for uh, congruent and incongruent uh, correct trials, and we have several measures that we can look at. First. Uh, the peak of the uh, lateralization of this um, di diffusion process would be a measure of the motor threshold. Then we have the slope 
that is influenced by the speed of evidence accumulation or the perceptual signal-to-noise ratio, which is modulated by attention. And finally, there is, of course, this distractor effect by the flankers, and that should be smaller if flanker processing is somehow reduced. So what signal in the brain could we use to measure uh, uh, such evidence accumulation? And work by uh, labs, for example, by uh, Tobias Donner and uh, Marco Siegel has suggested that uh, beta power over motor cortices could be quite informative about this. So you see uh, around responses there is a decrease in beta power uh, that is actually asymmetrical. It is stronger over the cortex contralateral to the responding hand. And this is nicely shown here in this regression against, uh, of left versus, uh, right versus left responses against beta power. So here you see at frontal central, uh, at, at, at central electrodes, you see uh, the activity uh, over ipsy and contralateral motor cortices. And you see that the reduction is stronger for the uh, uh, motor cortex um, or a contralateral to the responding hand. And on the other side, you see uh, the, actually the lateralization, just the difference of the two. And uh, interestingly, the peak of this lateralization coincides in all trials with the response that has been given by the subjects. So it pretty much reminded us uh, the behavior of a drift diffusion model. So let's look how, uh, how similar they are. So in the upper part, you see the results of the drift diffusion model. And do down here, you see the beta data from our uh, sample. And uh, the, the curves look remarkably similar. Uh, notably, this model was fitted to the behavioral data, not to the uh, uh, um, EEG data. And uh, so we can use beta lateralization as a proxy for a number of measures. Uh, the peak of the beta lateralization would be similar to the response threshold. The slope could indicate the, uh, the signal-to-noise ratio of evidence accumulation. And then we have this flanker effect, the distractor effect. Before showing you what happens after errors, let me first tell you about the behavioral findings. So we found post-error slowing uh, here in this graph. These are congruent and incongruent post-error trials in green and, blue, uh, and, and, and yellow. And in different shades of blue, you see uh, post-correct trials. And you see that reaction time is actually prolonged. And also the interference effect is reduced. So we have a post-error reduction of interference on uh, post-error trials. And uh, also accuracy was improved on post-error trials, which is mostly visible on post-error incongruent trials because accuracy on congruent trials is nearly at, salia, uh, at, at, at ceiling. So let's now look at our uh, putative measure of evidence accumulation, the beta lateralization. Left, on the left hand, you see the stimulus log lateralization. On the right hand, the response log beta lateralization for post-error and post-correct incongruent trials. And first, we can see that there's an increase in post-error uh, lateralization um, or post-error trials show an increased response threshold. This is consistent with the predictions of both models and also with findings by Kiani and Purcell, uh, who used the random dot motion task in monkeys and humans and had a similar finding. Um, we also find uh, that the effect of the flankers in incongruent trials is reduced after errors. So this could be due to an active suppression of flanker information or an increase of target information by directing attention. That is one explanation. That would be the adaptive explanation. Unfortunately, you could also con uh, uh, think of uh, some ideas how the orienting reflex could uh, lead to a similar finding uh, because you have an early disengagement generally from selective attention. So that would lead to a reduced signal-to-noise ratio in both flanker and target processing. So, and because that would be very early, it could predominantly affect the flanker effect. So in order to disentangle this, we looked at the slopes of the beta lateralization in congruent trials. And our reasoning was that after uh, orienting reflex, the slope of evidence accumulation should be actually s less steep. It should be, there should be more noise in the system. And that's not what we find. There is actually, for a long time, no difference in the slopes. And here on this plot, on the right side, you see actually the first derivative. So this is the time course of the slopes. And there is 
hard to see, at least on my screen here, there is a significant effect at the end of this uh, uh, flanker effect that actually the slope is steeper still for post-era trials. So this speaks more in favor of the, con uh, of the adaptive account uh, of post-era adjustments. So we don't know yet whether this generalizes to other tasks. Uh, perhaps not to the random dot motion task because uh, Purcell and Chiani showed different findings. They had actually a reduced slope. But still, I think with the beta power, we have a really good tool to address uh, decision-making processes uh, in cognitive control tasks and can study this non-invasively in humans. So let me summarize what we found. We have uh, several measures in EEG and fMRI that help us to disentangle the different stages of performance monitoring in the cognitive control loop. And in the end, I mentioned this uh, beta power lateralization, which I think actually bears quite some promise uh, for future studies. And uh, I, I'm very optimistic in using that in the future. And we also saw that uh, the uh, network con uh, consisting of the pre-SMA, right of here, frontal gyrus, and uh, subthalamic nucleus might be involved in implementing this threshold increase in, in this post-era slowing, and that at least perhaps later, more specific uh, adjustments of uh, attention are mediated by acetylcholine. And this brings me finally to the end. And I would like to uh, mention a number of people who were involved in this study, in particular Adrian Fischer and uh, Claudia Danielmeyer, who were both leading on uh, most of the studies I showed you uh, today. And I would, of course, like to thank you for your attention. And in the end, I would li also like to make a little announcement. So there's a PhD position open. So anybody who is interested, uh, just contact me or look at our website. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this excellent lecture. Questions? We have, uh, I think, time for one or two questions. Oh. Hi. So I have one question about the discussion whether postural slowing is orienting or adaptive. Um, at the beginning, you showed us that uh, the surprise um, the novelty stimuli, the surprise cause actually um, the posterior slowing. So doesn't it speak in favor of the orienting theory? It, it's, of course, I, I, I think there is uh, evidence for um, orienting reflex and also with errors. But um, the question is, um, is that the only effect that we have? Does it, does, how much does it actually influence our attentional regulation? So in this data, we see no effect on the attention of the orienting reflex. But this is a question. It depends probably on how surprising outcomes are, how, how uh, big the orienting reflex is, uh, whether this has an impact on your selective attention. So I'm not saying that this is not a mechanism. But I'm, uh, what I more wanted to uh, um, say is that we now have tools that can help us to disentangle these mechanisms and to study this and try to uh, control for a number of confounds that we actually were not even aware of uh, a few years ago. So, yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, here's a question. Uh, thank you for, uh, for an interesting talk. Uh, I have a... Here. Ah. Up there. Uh, yeah. Thank you for the talk. I have a rather technical question about the measurement of lo local field potentials in the STN. Yeah. Uh, so, so did you do it during the DBS, during the stimulation? No, and it was before. It was before. before. It was uh, people, I mean, in, uh, it's not common in all hospitals. Usually nowadays when you, when you operate on Parkinson's patients, you would not externalize the, the cables. But in that case, we still had access to the cables. So people were po post-operative, but the stimulator was not connected yet. So we just had the cables and could connect our amplifiers. Okay, because I, I was wondering if you do yeah. it during the DBS, then... During the DBS, then... no, uh, no way, because then you have these large uh, interfering uh, currents that would be very difficult, yeah. Uh, I have a question. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, uh, I'm here. Where is he? 
Yeah, wait here. Ah, down here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, would you comment on uh, individual differences? Because it is known that, for example, in addictions or in other uh, um, uh, people with, with uh, lower self, self control, uh, this uh, uh, ACC activity is uh, lower after errors, and uh, then and negative, uh, this uh, error connected negativity is also lower. So, how would you comment on this? Yeah, I mean, the, the there are quite large inter-individual differences in the air-related negativity, and that seems to be at least partly also genetically determined. We don't know exactly what it means. I mean, it seems to be associated with like uh, anxiety traits or uh, like obsessive-compulsive disorder, like people with OCD with uh, anxiety disorders do have usually a larger air-related negativity than normal uh, subjects, and. Also, like direct relatives, first grade relatives of OCD patients have actually an increased air related negativity. On the other hand, like in other uh, um, um, diseases like uh, schizophrenia, uh, you often see reduced air related negativity. So it is uh, a factor that can predict something about uh, uh, mental disorders. What I don't know exactly is how much the size that we see on an inter-individual di uh, difference level actually correlates to the ability of, of uh, adjusting behavior after errors. That's pretty unclear to me, and as I showed you, the, uh, the post-error slowing effect is not easily predicted across subjects. Um, so um, it's, it's still a mystery for me, actually, what factors actually contribute to this feedback or error-related negativity and uh, um, what these inter-individual differences mean. You know. But it's, it's an interesting topic and many people are actually following up on that. Okay, I have also a question. Uh, thank you, it was a very interesting uh, lecture. Um, I was uh, wondering about this uh, lateralization in beta power at the end that you talked about mm -hmm. because I actually also did some research a bit in that direction and I've actually observed that there are quite large individual differences. Some people show actually this lateralization uh, only in uh, lower alpha bands, sometimes in the higher alpha band, sometimes in the uh, higher uh, beta band, sometimes in the lower beta band. And uh, did you uh, examine the possibility that uh, actually you might miss some crucial information because you only look at the beta band? We have looked at the broader beta band, actually. We have uh, looked at this, uh, but I'm not sure. I mean, the strongest effect in the whole sample, which was extremely large, uh, uh, was in this rather low beta uh, band, of course. Did we look at the inter-individual differences? Not, not yet, I must uh, admit. So um, I, I cannot really give you an answer. Maybe we are missing something in some subjects that's certainly possible. Uh, overall, the strongest effect was in this range of 12 to uh, 25 hertz that we, uh, that we are reporting here. But um, it could be that we miss some subjects who have higher or lower uh, effects, yes. So all the work that you showed relied on visual stimuli and visual uh, processing. Um, what about other modalities? Let's say if you use uh, auditory or some other sensory sort of discrimination task, uh, do you expect the exact same outcome? Yes, I mean, I, I have usually, I'm usually using a, a visual domain stimuli, but there have been studies, of course, using other uh, um, modalities, and the error-related negativity does not seem to differ uh, uh, between, uh, so they have, and also the feedback-related uh, uh, negativity uh, has been shown for actually auditory, visual, and so much sensory. Uh, actually, one study we did with tactile stimuli, uh, completely lateralized also. We were hoping for some di differentiations, but we didn't find them. But uh, yeah, it seems to be, at least at the EEG level, independent of the... Of the um, stimulus uh, modality and also of the effector modality. I'm not that sure about the uh, fMRI study. Early, study uh, early studies of fMRI suggest that there's also no difference, but there are now more individualized approaches when people look at the uh, individual anatomy, whether you have a singlet and a parasingulate sulcus and so on. There you can see some, some um, motor representation, some kind of a uh, homunculus-like uh, representation. So there I would expect at least uh, a relationship to the effector, not maybe that much to the uh, um, 
the input channel. Okay, I think we can close the session. If there will be more questions, I think that Professor Buschberger can answer them uh, during the welcome reception, because there is a welcome reception waiting for us. Okay, so uh, once again, welcome to Krakow and have a very good evening today. <laughs>